Terrific. So uh, what we'd love to do before I start asking each of you and all of you some questions and opening up to the group is uh, maybe just to go around and tell us a little bit about your, your journey here, uh, maybe for a minute or two, uh, and some of the things that get you excited about the entrepreneurial ecosystem in New Zealand. Do you want to start? I can start. Um, so the journey here for me, um, interesting journey today actually this morning, <laughs> coming in from Auckland. But um, the journey to New Zealand for me uh, is a really interesting one. Um, so I grew up in Germany, spent a lot of time in, um, in the UK working there and then um, getting tired of the corporate world in the UK and of, to be honest, of life in the UK a little bit. And, um, but I, I've always had a, a strong passion for an English speaking environment and being a bit of an Anglophile. I, I knew that I, I needed to go somewhere else. And then um, fortunately, a good friend of mine told me about New Zealand and I pretty much just packed up my bags and um, shipped everything over to New Zealand um, and just gave it a go. And I thought, well, the worst thing that can happen is I could have an awesome time for you know, a year and then I'll just go back to uh, my, my other life. Um, but I've stayed, so I've been here for 10 years now. And one of the key things um, that I'm really passionate about is that I, um, and I can say this as, a, as, an, as an outsider who's not got a Kiwi passport, but I sometimes feel like um, Kiwis um, put themselves down too much and um, always think they're um, not quite on, I don't know, on par with everyone else. I always look at, oh, Australia is so much better, the US is so much better, and um, you know, what would it be like if we, um, if we had that here? And from a European perspective, I think, um, especially from Germany, like New Zealand is actually seen as paradise. Like everyone wants to, you know, make it to New Zealand and love New Zealand products and, and love holidaying here. And I think if we had that, that um, knowledge here and that, and that spirit and just be a little bit more proud of that and say, yeah, it doesn't matter where we are, um, New Zealand's a fabulous country, um, then you know, it'd be a lot easier to get some of those initiatives off the ground and, and just be a little bit more confident in the world. So that's my take on it. Thank you. I'm Candice Kinzer. I moved here 17 years ago uh, from Hawaii and it was meant to be similarly a year and then heading back to go to law school, which I escaped. Um, so, yeah, so I ended up staying. I'm an anthropologist by training. Um, so New Zealand was actually kind of a, a, a natural fit in many ways, originally from Texas. So I come with a lot of interesting baggage um, into an environment where um, it is complete dichotomy. It's absolutely opposite of what I grew up in, in many ways. Um, but on the other hand, grew up with a very strong uh, mother and female figure who always told me, you know, go into the world, don't do what I had to do, which was stay here and raise kids. Um, bless her heart, but I've done that. And within New Zealand, I think what I've been able to discover is that through a journey of some very interesting experiences, both being an employee, um, being given the opportunity to run a really interesting software business um, a few years ago, and then recently in the position of representing um, the technology industry of New Zealand internationally, and I took that role very seriously. And that is how I came to meet Yosef and the Monaghan brothers and um, had some really exciting times. So now I'm a director of a number of companies. Um, took one of the companies to listing in August, which was very exciting, a Kiwi tech company. And now also working as an advisor for a small little tech business out of Silicon Valley called Palantir, uh, who are also doing some interesting things. Um, and that's about it for me. Thank you. Um. Yeah, I, I sort of fell into the world of entrepreneurship after trying a few other things that I thought I was passionate about, but I was kind of wrong. Um, I was originally going to be a policeman in New Zealand, uh, so I started down a quite a quite a different path. Then I did a, a Bachelor of Arts degree in First World War History, which just kind of naturally led me into technology entrepreneurship. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, it's kind of uh, kind of a bit of a theme, really. So, so my big things about about growth. Um, personal growth, growth of other people, and um, I was fortunate to be part of a, a team of three of us that decided to go down the startup journey and, and kind of got it right, fortunately, um, six years and, and sold it to a, a US publicly listed company. Um, and that was a real buzz in terms of why I'm so passionate about entrepreneurship and helping others take the same journey, hopefully with a much bigger scalar of success, is that feeling of creating something from nothing 
is, is like something I've never experienced at anything else. Um, and I've done quite a few dangerous things that were kind of adrenaline pumping, but you know, that, that's the one that sort of sustains for me. So um, I spend most of my time now uh, trying to help others. I do have a little adventure I've been working on for a couple of years, which is about to surface in New Zealand. Um, I'm a recovering entrepreneur until that hits the, hits the ground in about the middle of the year. And yeah, I mean, I'm really trying to share my experiences and connections and networks to help lots of other Kiwi entrepreneurs and Kiwi companies and the people that they support and, and, and encourage by doing that and leading that uh, be more successful on the global stage. And yeah, it's a, it's a real buzz. Hopefully it will be for the rest of my life. Um, my first question is to Candice. It's been uh, really fascinating to see the way you've really navigated the entrepreneurial ecosystem in New Zealand as part of NZ Tech, and you got to see and meet so many entrepreneurs and policy makers. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious to hear if we do a litmus test of where we are right now as an ecosystem, what type of a dent are we making in the world? And what is the potential you see for the New Zealand ecosystem to do so over the next few years? Right, well, I think that um, in terms of where New Zealand is, if you start comparing you know, to other countries, I think that's the first dangerous sort of tightrope to start walking because there's so many differences between us and Silicon Valley and you know, Germany and any other part of the world that it's important to be aware of what else is going on in the world. Uh, but we're in such an enviable position of having a government that is actually very supportive of the business sector in terms of funding and in terms of, I mean, the fact that Matt's here from immigration and we had Colin, who was the head of DIA, who was sitting in, you know, in the audience just, just a few minutes ago. That sort of cohesive embracement that government gives to business is incredibly unique for this country. And I think that as we start our journey into the next phase of entrepreneurship for New Zealand. We're kind of coming to the second cycle and the third cycle for some of the entrepreneurs. It's all about taking what we've learned overseas, using the best and embracing that and rejecting things that we say that don't work, but also creating um, a lot of the aspects like you know the funding and the support that we have. Um, where we are fitting in, I think, um, you know, I've said it a million times that the New Zealand way of going about creating business is flying under the radar in many ways and finding very niche opportunities that either large corporates or other organizations or people around the world may overlook or just say, oh, it's not worth it. Or, you know, why would we want to do that? There's already 10 other companies in the world that are doing that. But we tend to do it. We tend to do it really well. And there's people that are sitting in the audience today, you know, that um, like Vaughn uh, with, with Vend, you know, and point of sale software. You've had the, the zero stories. You've had a whole bunch of companies that they've just taken a bright idea and gone a little bit left of center and really made an impact and made a difference on the world stage in that space. So I don't think it's about creating a business like Nokia or creating an Apple or anything like that. It's all about creating a whole bunch of small, sustainable, highly actionable businesses in niche areas. And I think that's what we should focus on and what we do best. Any reflections for either of you? If not, I can move to the next question. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, John, you touched a little bit about Kiwi Landing Pad. Um, and from the various conversations we've had in the past, uh, you seem very passionate about building bridges and connecting the dots between New Zealand and our ecosystem here with Silicon Valley, which is where we see a huge gravitation uh, of entrepreneurs and technologists moving towards right now. What do you see is so important in building such bridges for our ecosystem to thrive here? Um, so I think the biggest thing for me is that, uh, you know, the, um, there's kind of two aspects. One is often the best path is the one that's most trodden. Um, and so for I think a lot of the base stuff that um, most Kiwi entrepreneurs who want to build a global business need to do, not necessarily just in Silicon Valley or the US, there's a lot of merit in sharing and understanding how to do that fundamental stuff quickly so that you can get on, to your point, to the real stuff around differentiating. Sometimes a similar idea, but in a different or niche or unique way, which is really what creates the value and the engagement with the marketplace. Um, so you know, I think that cross-pollination of ideas, um, both in the area that you're working in, but just generally around people who have taken a position 
on growing something uh, or standing up for something and that leadership position that they've taken and that resilience and that sustainability that they've had to have, um, I think is one of the biggest things. And so Landing Pad, you know, we've just started this year actually trying to, to proactively and, and sometimes accidentally integrate some companies from the local ecosystem into the pad so that Kiwi entrepreneurs can go there and see local folks doing. And I think culturally, it's still quite a big shift for people uh, coming from New Zealand. I see it still quite a lot. And they land and it's, you know, geographically, it's a long way away. It's a big plane trip. And they kind of get a little bit of a knockback realising that nothing really gets any easier by actually making that move. In fact, it's harder from the perspective of going out and meeting and connecting with those people. So I think the more that we can do that on both sides and get that familiarity and that, that social aspect and that learning going faster, um, coming back to your question, it's really a way of accelerating our place and our growth in that particular part of the market around entrepreneurship. And, and what time horizons are you looking at in terms of seeing real impact and at the scale that you'd like to see on the ecosystem? It's, it's pretty short, it's about 20 years. Um, yeah, I mean, that's I, I kind of say that and people, I, I think if we really want to make a difference around, you know, the potential that being a you know, serious, consistent player in this space with all the creativity and, and, and all the innovation that we do have, I think really that's the time frame to sustain. And I, you know, I've worked on a lot of corporate innovation projects and one of the biggest barriers right from the get-go is that the time frame to success is, is generally not longer than about three years. And the sort of impact and the sort of foundations that they have to lay for truly long-standing staff, particularly when we're in this world of engagement where you know lifetime value in all aspects is just such an important metric um the the, the horizon the runway is too short and for uh many of our friends who are coming from the us who do not know about q landing pad it's, it's creating a soft landing space uh in san francisco for kiwi startups who are looking to base themselves over in the us and helping them network with the whole ecosystem and it's been a great honor working with you guys over the last few months um, Stefan, with uh, Creative HQ, uh, you guys are helping nurture entrepreneurs here and providing a, a supporting environment and, and, and space for them to flourish and thrive while they're here. What are some of the lessons that you've, you've learned over the last few years in doing that and in the way that's really best to actually nurture entrepreneurs here? What are some of the best ways we can nurture our, uh, our entrepreneurs here in New Zealand. Yeah, it's a, it's a, that's a big question, um, and I think it, it ranges from you know the tactical and operational stuff, um, just some some basic skills around um, how do you run a business, um, you know, avoiding the mistakes that others have made. Um, all of that is probably the sort of the bread and butter of what a lot of the incubation and acceleration programs um, teach um, entrepreneurs. But I think, so more recently, we've realized that um, a big focus for us, for example, has become on resilience. And, you know, sort of really, um, you know, get, getting the, especially the younger entrepreneurs, um, to, to get to a point where they, they realize that it's going to be a rough ride in, in, in many ways. And, and you, you can prepare yourself for that. And, and you, there's stuff that you can do, again, coming back to this idea of being, being balanced and... Um, Looking after yourself because if you're, um, if you're not, you know, if you're mentally out of whack and you're stressed and you're imbalanced, um, your business is going to um, feel the impact of that. And um, I think that's often neglected um, with all the hard skills that we teach. It's it's all the soft skills that uh, in the end make a big difference. And so we've shifted focus a little bit, bit from just focusing on the hard skills to now bringing all of those things in. Um, and including, um, yeah, some of the, the things that I mentioned earlier around, um, you know, doing entrepreneur retreats, getting those guys to actually look after themselves, um, looking into you know, their health, um, you know, um, food and, you know, all of those things. Um, it's, it's really important and so, so that be, it becomes more of a rounded experience rather than just, um, you know, how do you um, get this business off the ground and, and, you know, make a ton of money. A question for all of you is uh, around, uh, I'd call it equality, when it comes to entrepreneurship. I know Candice, you've been working a lot in supporting more women entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and um, 
we don't have enough women entrepreneurs in New Zealand. Uh, we did a project with Kiwi Connect trying to tell the stories of women entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and really highlight the potential and gaps that exist here. Um, but also during the course of the last few days, some of the questions that have come up is uh, how many Maori uh, communities are actually embracing entrepreneurship and uh, what's the percentage of the entrepreneurship community um, is actually coming from Maori communities. Um, and there's also you know, young students and, and people of various ages. How open is the entrepreneurship landscape to uh, individuals who wanna get started in, in an entrepreneurial path? That's a good question. I don't think that there's a natural prejudice in New Zealand to say just because you're female or because you're from a minority race, therefore you cannot be an entrepreneur. I think the problem that has existed and one of the projects that I did late last year was called Shadow IT. And we went around to uh, about 15 different schools, low decile schools in South Auckland and selected two young women who are about 14 or 15 years old and placed them with a CEO of a high performing tech company for the day to just shadow them and see what was going on. And it was an amazing from the, in the morning to see, you know, they're very quite quiet and passive. And at the end of the day, it was just a cacophony of noise when we all regrouped in MIT. And one of the key learnings I think that everybody who experienced that day had was it's not about the fact that they're not good enough or you know, there's not the opportunity. It's about creating that interest and supporting that interest from a young age, uh, regardless of your race or you know, your gender. Um, so that's one, I think, step that New Zealand can really work on um, quite significantly, is um, really fostering that belief in technology and um, entrepreneurship from a younger age. Um, a second area in starting, when I started the Women in Tech about two and a half years ago, it was more of an experiment to actually see how many women are in tech, you know, in terms of senior leadership roles, CIO roles, et cetera. And we started out with about half a dozen women that would come to a lunch in Wellington and Auckland. At the moment, there's over 215 members now that come regularly, and that's growing. And so in saying that, when you try to transition these women who are CIOs, you know, for Air New Zealand or, you know, running, um, you know, previously Fujitsu, et cetera, and say, what would it take for you to actually step away from your safety net and go out and start a business? Well, there's two key catalysts for usually why women start a business, one of which is out of necessity. And you see that a lot in Southeast Asia, for example. You know, they have to feed their families to survive. Um, and the other one is out of interest or boredom in what they're doing in their day-to-day -day job. And hey, wouldn't that be cool? In New Zealand, we're kind of in the middle in some ways. And so there isn't really the safety net and the catalyst um, that's well known and appreciated for women to step away from the safety net, kind of go into this purgatory for a little while, and then be able to launch into an entrepreneurial type position. Uh, but at the same time, there's no real desperation to have to go out there and earn a living as an entrepreneur because we do have the social environment that we have. So it is a good question. I don't actually know the answer, but I think it really comes down to encouragement and just a real understanding of the drivers that create female entrepreneurs and minority entrepreneurs and try to emphasize the goodness of making that happen and that it will be okay to fail and it will be okay to take five or seven years to get your idea off the ground, that we don't have to be the two-year turnaround for a startup. It's different here. So I just wanted to share some good news. Um, we've um, run our acceleration program, Lightning Lab, for a few years in Wellington, and one of the big criticisms was, well, you don't see many um, women participating in it. Um, there were a few female entrepreneurs, but um, you know, the ratio was like 90% male. And then so uh, a program that we finished last week, which we did with um, the Young Entrepreneur um, Scheme with Terry here in the office, uh, in, the, in the office, <laughs> in the tent, um, uh, called Venture Up. And the really cool thing to see there, this is um, a mini acceleration program targeting um, young, uh, young entrepreneurs aged sort of 16, um, between 16 and 21. Mm. And there were more women in the program than um, men. And I thought that was fantastic. And there were uh, several all-female teams um, and also, um, you know, Pacific Island. It was a really diverse group. Um, and so this is the next generation that we're talking about. And I just thought um, sometimes a little bit depressing to look around, uh, you know, in, in um, big programs and realize that there are not many women in the room. But um, just wanted to share some good news that the next generation is getting that. And, and I think they're a lot more confident about going into business. And the culture shift is beginning to happen, which is awesome. And investors are realizing that the returns on women-owned businesses as well are often higher, the ones that do yeah. succeed. So that's been good too. Do you want to say that in the mic? Yeah. 
Sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, I was also saying that uh, there has been a lot of research that's come out that investors are finding the returns that they're receiving off of uh, you know female-owned businesses, particularly in the tech space, uh, are significantly greater um, over a four to five-year time period. Um, not sure why. Um, it just is, is just happening and trending that way. And in the U.S., they have a lot of VC firms that are now being created to solely invest in women-owned um, businesses, which is quite good too. Um, yeah, I, I just find it intriguing from, from a number of aspects why we have this sort of imbalance. Um, and I guess the encouraging thing, sort of follow up on what you were saying, is that it feels like there's more um, balancing, but still a, a big gap. Um, the most intriguing thing for me is just purely capitalistic. It's like, you know, um, decision makers uh, and a lot of consumer product and, you know, a bunch of markets are way, way predominantly uh, sitting in the female side of a household or, or decision making uh, capability. And I know when we built a, a software company um, servicing the HR market, human resources and corporates, I mean, um, that was in 2006. And one of our big frustrations as we grew that company was trying to find. Um, female board members and executives um, to give us that perspective because our buyer was, you know, 42 to 52 years old, female, almost, you know, 95% of the time. And you just can't kind of think in the, in the same capacity or ask the same questions. And, and I think the other thing from an entrepreneurship point of view, put myself out there, sorry guys, is, is I think that, you know, the, the successful female entrepreneurs and corporate executives that I've been fortunate to be involved with, um, it's been a long time at HP under... Uh, working directly for their first um, female CEO and first external CEO to HP ever. Um, so that was a pretty intriguing experience in, in, um, in a bunch of ways in terms of understanding how tough that is, uh, just, just generally speaking, then taking on the diversity side of things. But the resilience side, you know, which has come through quite a lot here, I, I sort of, uh, if I was asked to vote one way or the other in terms of gender resilience, I, I'd have to go strongly that, you know, that's a quality that I think um, we see more consistently, or certainly I see more consistently on the female side, and, and that's such an important makeup of all aspects of these businesses. So it's not surprising to hear that you know VCs are kind of seeing those those trends as well. So we have about uh, 50 or so guests who have joined us from the US, and uh, are really interested and passionate about one learning about the New Zealand ecosystem and finding ways to support and plug in. So I'm curious to hear from each of you, what are some of the biggest challenges that you see in the local ecosystem, and how can we help? <laughs> um, uh, one thing is actually making it easy for others who want to come in from other parts of the world um, um, to help us in New Zealand, and it's great to see uh, immigration here. Uh, I've been trying to engage with you uh, a number of times, and, and successfully as well, but what we really need is um, a, an easy way for, for those who want to come to New Zealand with a lot of skills, especially, to help us further build the ecosystem uh, and, and benefit from the experience uh, and make it easy. And sometimes I think we have this, this mindset that, um, or certainly what I've picked up from immigration in some of the categories, it seems to be this... Well, to be here in New Zealand is a privilege, and we kind of have to guard that a little bit, and we, we have, there's, there's a hurdle that you have to jump over. Uh, and I think we need to um, look at it from the other way, which is, well, people who want to come here um, for all sorts of reasons um, with, with their skills, let's make it as easy as possible. Let's not let them you know, fill out hundreds of forms and, and get all of the stuff. Let's you know, bring them in and, and deal with that later and, and let them stay here for a few years. And they may want to stay for longer or they may want to go back. But we can um, benefit so much from just the sheer experience of people coming over. And I think... Um, if we had a way, and I'm appealing to immigration to, to make, make that a lot easier than it is for us at the moment to bring people over, um, that would be my one big ask. And it's totally in our control, so let's do it. If I could quickly comment on that, um, yesterday we actually had Nigel Bickle, the head of immigration here, and we had some really interesting conversations around possibilities of making uh, the immigration uh, 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 process a lot more appealing to entrepreneurs and we're left with some few action items on some ideas that we can propose to make it a lot easier for entrepreneurs to come here, which is looking to uh, propose to the cabinet and the prime minister as well. 
Um, so look, I'll steal um, some thinking from the landing pad in terms of what we're trying to instill in that ecosystem and community, um, which is really boils down to sort of three areas, which is, um, is confidence, um, credibility and connections. So those are the sort of three verticals that we're trying to build out and I think, you know, everybody um, can help us with. Um, you know, confidence is something I think that, you know, we probably underplay a little bit here, especially with the whole sort of moving into a, a much more fast-paced, concentrated environment if we're talking about Silicon Valley. So just having people share experiences and, and you know, actually make it literally as simple as saying, you know, this is, we're all human beings here and, you know, there's only 24 hours in a day and there's some constants here that sort of, um, I think a lot of Kiwi entrepreneurs go in a bit overawed um, about the experience. So certainly engaging with people this side and, and, and you know, giving that confidence by engaging them and, and sharing things. And then that sort of leads on to the second piece, which is this credibility. I mean, everybody only has the same number of minutes in a day and an hour. So, you know, to be um, getting in a useful interaction with people, you need to have some endorsement or, or credibility, ideally from your community or other individuals that the person you're trying to connect with on a, on a first-time basis or for a specific reason can, can relate to. Um, and, you know, that, that then allows people to be very comfortable making those connections and, um, and endorsing those. So I think around those three areas is a fantastic opportunity um, to work more closely with our, with our business and tourist you know, visitors who have those sort of understandings and networks. I mean, the one thing I've learned about this world is it's truly a village. You kind of bump into people all over the place. But to turn that into you know, a more entrepreneurial, more specific goal, I think that you you need to have some, some more help, you know, some more worldly knowledge and connections and, and community stuff happening all the time to just keep you primed up for that. Comments for you? Sure, well, briefly, I guess, given that I'm, I'm American, who've moved here, um, I'd say from an anthropologist's perspective, um, coming to New Zealand was much more of an experience in trying to find acceptance in a world that was a lot more um, difficult than I thought it would be when I came here. And it was the little things that really got me in the beginning, um, English but not, you know, morning tea, afternoon tea, just little things. And this one I was 25, so it was a while ago. Um, but where I think you adapt and how you come to appreciate this environment is to understand um, the protectiveness, you know, that New Zealand has over the wonderful things that it does have. Hence, you know, yes, sometimes barriers are good uh, from the perspective that it makes people work for something that they really want. And I agree with you, you know, there could be other aspects to get through it. Um, but in living here and in working here, I've never been around an environment or an ecosystem of people that are so interconnected that truly believe and want to help others succeed. And it is a very foreign concept in many ways. Um, but I think that it's one that if we can get more interest and diversity, I mean, Auckland just passed 51% mark last year of the population of Auckland. 51% is from another country, um, which is unheard of. And, you know, that to me, when I moved here 17, 18 years ago, I was pretty much the American girl in town, you know, that I knew. And now, you know, I can't go to a meeting where there's not another American or Canadian or, I mean, even on stage. I think you're from here? Yeah. Okay. So we've got one out of four <laughs> that's actually from New Zealand. So it is, it is pretty special. Yeah. Mm. Just to echo what you talked about, uh, uh, the willingness to help. Yeah. And that's something that I've experienced so much since I moved out here. And a lot of it is just actually relationships with many of you. Uh, and that is how even this event came to be is yeah. just through that openness and desire and willingness to yeah. help someone. Um, and one of the reflections from my end has been coming here is uh, there's always benefit of the doubt when you meet someone first. So you always greet it with you're good unless proven otherwise rather than mm -hmm. you're bad unless proven otherwise. And that's just been so warm to experience here in New Zealand. I'd love to just open it up for questions from the crowd. Um, I'll give my microphone to Rebecca. Questions, reflections. Um, thanks all for um, yeah your thoughts and reflections. Um, I guess going back to that idea of inequality and having more women in entrepreneurship and in tech, 
What do you see the roles of of companies and of entrepreneurs in actually coaching women to feel like they can step into those positions of leadership? Because I think you touched on it, John, in that all the time people who are organising um, conferences and events, they run up against the same problem. We can't find enough women entrepreneurs who are wanting to come out and speak. So what do you think is the role that you can all play in actually actively mentoring and coaching women to feel like they can take that position? Um, look, I think it's it, it does be in my mind um, quite proactive. But once again, I sort of default to the to the more selfish company reasons for that around getting that perspective into into a business. Um, so you know, I think a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, leading companies, looking at assessing talent and, and making those decisions, probably need to take a uh, a diversity view. Um, you know equally or maybe even slightly ahead in some cases of a, of a close run kind of skills and experience um, gap. That's really the only way in my mind to, to start, you know, bridging a, a, a numbers issue. Um, you know, I sit on a number of boards and, and it has been good to see in the last probably 18 months that a lot of our shortlisted candidates for executive roles within those companies have included uh, um, women, but it's still very, very light. Um, so I guess the second piece of that is probably a responsibility of taking up you know, some of those um, second-run candidates, um, uh, you know, people um, who do look like they have a lot of potential and, um, and encouraging them and kind of thinking just that much harder about where else they might, uh, might fit for their next career move. One of the coolest um, approaches that I've seen is from Vaughan here, from Vend. We were organising a, a conference um, when Scott and Sam were coming over at the end of last year and Vaughan... We were asking him to speak. Warns like, "Where are the cool chicks on this on this panel with me? Here's a bunch of names. These are some people." And I think just as far as you know, through connections and suggesting people is a good way to go as well. So, further comments or reflections? Oh, I, I think, uh, oh it was just uh, um, another comment on the um, you know how, what we can do, and and absolutely um, would reiterate that uh, sometimes it shows uh, it needs a little bit of leadership of just prompting that okay so what else can we do and rather than just sort of go for the um, the usual suspects um, and and going further now, now there are actually a number of really inspirational you know women around and leaders it's just um, for us and, and many of them are here um, it's uh, it's it's just really taking that um, I don't know being mindful about it and say right well what else can we do uh, another thing that I wanted to say was just um, well we recently got to a creative HQ is that um, our job is, we see our job as normalizing entrepreneurship and normalizing the startup experience. Because um, what we've heard back from a lot of people is that when they have conversations with their peers and they say, so what do you do? Uh, oh, I've got my own company, I'm an entrepreneur. And they go, oh, that's, that's a bit weird. And, you know, I've got a normal job at, you know, wherever. And so, um, actually, I think that... Um, showing especially the younger generation that running your own company, starting your own business um, and being an entrepreneur is, you know, just as great a career option as anything else. And so that, that sort of normalization of it, I think, will make it also more accessible. And what we've seen with that next generation is that they are taking that on and they go, yeah, well, I'll just do it. And, you know, um, I'll, I'll learn a lot. And in the end, no matter what happens, uh, I'll either be a much better employee than I would have been or... Um, I'm, I'm enjoying my life in that company that I've created. Um, and so I think that'll, that'll make it a little bit more accessible as well. I have a question. Um, so, so I sort of look at New Zealand as small but powerful. Um, but one of the biggest problems that we have in San Francisco is where does our pipeline come from? So we've got a lot of great co-working spaces and incubators and programs, but we don't really have the people to put into these programs. So there's amazing people here, but where do those people come from? So I guess I'm interested in what age you think we should really be targeting people so that the future generations become the people who we are mentoring and growing and, you know, other future New Zealand success stories. I think Terry should answer. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I was going to suggest that. <laughs> Terry. Go, yes. Terry. Yeah. Thanks. That's a really good question and one that we personally love. Um, it's really interesting. There was a really great um, study that came out of a university in California about 20 years ago, which said that five, uh, if you look at the uh, um, kids at the age of five, one third of five-year-olds have the traits and attributes naturally to be entrepreneurial. 
by the time they graduate high school or secondary school, that's down to 3%. So what we like to say is that we actually train it out of our kids. And if you think of a lot of traditional schooling, a lot of traditional education, it's all about following what everyone else does. So we kind of flip it a little bit on its head, which says the earlier the better, and it's never too early to start. But worse yet, it's not like teaching somebody the basics of um, adding and subtracting before you get to calculus. It's actually embracing what's naturally in a five-year-old who thinks they can do anything um, and helping to develop it before you lose it as well. Terry, could you just tell us a little bit about the organization you run? Because I don't know if everybody would be aware of that. Okay, thanks. Um, so I have the privilege of running an organization called Young Enterprise Trust, and it's a charity designed to uh, develop business skills, entrepreneurship, and financial capability in young people. Um, most people within New Zealand are probably familiar with us. We've got very good brand awareness. Most people are familiar with our flagship program, the Lion Foundation Young Enterprise Scheme, or YES, as we affectionately call it. Uh, where senior secondary students get to set up and run an actual business while they're still in school. Real products and services, real profit and loss. Uh, what people don't necessarily realize is, um, A, there's a charity behind the scenes that make it happen. They think, I don't know, schools do it or the Ministry of Education does, uh, but they don't. Um, they don't realize we start our programs in year one and staircase up to year 13. They don't realize we do financial literacy. And they don't realize that in addition to doing um, a delivery model through the schools, we have about 1,100 business people a year that volunteer with us as a coach or judge as a men or mentor. And so that's actually bringing real business experience into the classroom. And I guess to the point you guys were making earlier, one of the challenges we see is that um, if you look at diversity or people that are um, in a more privileged position, it's not about capability. It's about two things. It's about expectations. So if you grow up in an environment where you're expected to do well, you're more likely to achieve it. Um, and it's also about the, the network. So you know, if you go to a Decile 10 school, that's kind of a way of saying a wealthy school, um, in you know, a private school, you know, chances are you've got a school community around you of not just your parents, but other parents who come from business backgrounds and can encourage you. If you come from a low decile school, so a, very, um, a school in a very poor economic area um, where parents don't have business experience, you're not going to have those same networks and connections. So I guess my challenge to everyone else here is we see so many New Zealanders wanting to give back, but are you thinking of giving back within your immediate community or going to a community that would, I guess, benefit a bit more um, than where your kids go to school? Thanks for that, Terry. We've got time for two more questions. Hi. Um, I guess this is kind of directed at John and Stefan as people who run programs to maximize the impact of small companies starting out. And, well, I guess I'd love to hear from you too, Candice. But um, how do you, I mean, we heard a call this morning from Matthew about thinking deeply about impact and that not all impact is the same and we need to be conscious about um, positive impact. And I'm wondering how that fits into your decision making about which nascent companies to support or maximize the impact of? Like, where does social impact fit in your decision making? Um, I, I think it's a great question. I was actually thinking about it in the previous sort of scenario about growing the, the pipeline where you start that is because it's, it's kind of a really unusual area. And, and you know, we, we kind of run a, pro a community more than a program, but we do have to make some decisions around. Um, who we support because you know there's tacit you know tangible costs involved and so forth um, and you know it's just shitty playing God to a lot of these things um, to your point because a lot of them one the entrepreneur is incredibly passionate about what they do but you know we I guess have a quite a fortunate lens in that we can say look we we really only have a fit for certain things that we think we can advance and help that's our sort of mandate but there are certainly lots of things where we see people absolutely passionate, um, often socially, often you know just just down a path of, of solving a real problem that they're obsessed with. Um, so th I don't have an answer as to how we do it. And and the other piece of it is, um, you know, this entrepreneurial journey. It's not like a, a standard career where you're sort of moving someone through you know levels of accountancy or 
or legal proficiency. I mean, there are some realities around some entrepreneurs who you know may show all the attributes who are just not going to make it time one, time two, time three, but possibly massively time four. So it's it's a very difficult line to draw. Um, and I guess, you know, probably from, from our example, the social impact side of it, um, to be frank, you know, probably takes a second place to a lot of the assessments because we're driven by, you know, uh, prominence of a different set of, of metrics, rightly or wrongly. Um, and, you know, I think it's probably something that it's, it's time to, to have a good look at. Yeah, I agree. And, and I mean, also, the, the thing that I've been recently been concerned with is that from a, you know, as an organization that's funded by, you know, government um, mostly, there's currently this distinction between social entrepreneurship and, you know, everything else. And I think that's unhelpful um, because um, a lot of what we see, especially through the, the Venture Up program and the, the younger entrepreneurs, pretty much everything they do has got this social aspect baked in. It's actually not like coming in from a, oh, I want to do good in the world, so I have to start a charity or I have to start a social enterprise. Every idea they come up with already has that ingrained. It's, it's part of it. It's not a separate thing. And I think sometimes by you know, government programs labeling this and, oh, this has to be a social enterprise or this, this is a program to support this, um, we're almost making it more difficult uh, because then it creates this artificial competition um, with some organizations, which, which is absolutely not helpful. And so from our perspective, we don't actually distinguish at all. Like for us, it's about <clears throat> the team, the entrepreneur, and the validity of their idea and their approach and, and helping them, um, you know, um, I don't know, help them fulfill their potential. And then if, you know, the idea is a good one and an impactful one from a social perspective, then that's great. Um, there's probably a few areas that we would... Um, stay away from um, for our organization where we can tell that something is ex going to be extremely um, um, unbeneficial to everyone like um, you know gambling things or <laughs> I don't know like just ideas where we go well we we, we don't want to be involved with but everything else um, we, we don't distinguish um, at all so yeah um, I don't think it's a matter of we, we can't particularly encourage them but if they come they'll be supported um, through the programs that exist. Thanks, that's really cool. And I, what's really exciting me in this space is as the understanding of the measurement and matrix of true value are kind of rapidly accelerating all over the world at the moment, I think we're going to be able to see um, some ways that we can um, take these things into consideration as far as our, our screening in a positive way rather than just negative screening as you were mentioning with you know tobacco or alcohol or, or what have you so I'm really excited about that space so final question from Vaughan we're really um, honoured and humbled that you could join us today Vaughan Thanks um, So entrepreneurship is pretty hard right and there's uh, at least the entrepreneurs I know often get the balance out of whack you're having to balance up all the expectations of investors and board and team. And there's a certain uh, level of stoicism that comes with being an entrepreneur. You know, everything's always great and everything's going to be okay and I'm fine. Uh, but like, just lately, I've kind of been a bit over the whole stoicism thing and been actually talking to entrepreneurs and about how, but how's it really going? And, and the reality is everybody has their, their battles that, they, that they're fighting but they don't have a support network around them that they can talk to about. So my question is, where are these support networks and what have you seen, whether it's here domestically or abroad? You know, if, if EA Entrepreneurs Anonymous doesn't exist, then uh, how, how do we kick that off? How do we get that going? I'll just dive in there. I think that's a really good point. I gave a talk um, a few months ago that was actually quite emotional for me. It was at the University of Auckland. I was particularly on that subject. It was when I was running Biomatters, which actually wasn't founded by me, but I was able to step in and, and take it from woe to go. And during the course of six years, I ended up getting married, losing my marriage, you know, having my life pretty much fall apart because it was just this hell-bent attitude of, you know, I've got to, I've got to, I've got to be away for another six weeks, sweetheart, I'm sorry, you've got to run the ship again, you know, and, and you can only do that so many times, as well as being emotionally unavailable and, 
exactly that. And I've found that I've spoken to a number of entrepreneurs, particularly in the previous role that I was in with NZ Tech in Silicon Valley, and I shall not name names, who were kind of going through the same thing. And one of the guys that I spoke to in particular, he was saying, look, actually, I don't think he'd mind, Scott Houston, you know, when he was doing Green Button. And I've known him since I worked at Telecom and we started up, you know, the grid and, and that became eventually Green Button and the whole nine yards. And he'd been away from his partner in New Zealand for months on end. He'd sold his boat, he'd sold his house. I mean, those who know him, he basically did the hard yards. And I was walking back during America's Cup at about 1 a.m. from the village to our hotel. And I get emotional about it because he was very like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't have any more money. And I just said, just stop. I said, just stop. And he's like, I can't. I can't stop. I can't stop. And I said, yes, you can. And from that point, I think about two or three months later is when they ended up selling Green Button, you know, and the stars aligned. And I think it was almost that release of just saying, I haven't got any more left to give or I'm not willing to give anymore. And I totally 100% agree with you because I've also spoken to other, particularly male entrepreneurs who have also really put their relationships in jeopardy. And um, it's really just getting that fundamental understanding and that coaching that it's not worth it. You know, it's not worth losing everything in your life for the success of a business. But at the same time, you don't have to go there. You know, there's a better path and there's a better way. And Vaughn and I were just talking right now. It's like for the first time in my life, I've actually gotten myself in a position of being a director on some good boards and doing an advisory role. And I am working maybe 20 hours a week, 30 hours a week. And it's freaked me out for the past two months because I'm like having the shakes going, I need more to do. I need to fill my days. I need to have these 60 hour weeks again. And I've just really internally tried to start breathing and calming down and saying, there's more to it than that. And just open yourself and open your mind and relax and, and you know, open yourself to new opportunities. But I think EA would be fantastic, particularly from New Zealanders who are not conditioned to admit that there's any difficulty going on. And this environment doesn't really allow it either because you've just got to keep going. And the VCs don't want to hear that you're falling over. Your directors don't want to hear it. Your employees sure as hell don't want to hear it. Um, but we, we need to find a way of creating that outlet and helping people um, admit that they need some help. Mm -hmm. So um, you mentioned action points from um, the other day. I think this would be a great action point to take um, from, from this day is to actually create something like EA um, and, uh, and, and just make it happen. Um, yeah, uh, because I, I couldn't agree more. Um, entrepreneurs are under a lot of pressure, investors, you know, employees and all that, and it's, it's hard to open up, mm -hmm. and it needs a special environment, and I think it needs special, I don't know, um, guidance around how to do that because it doesn't come natural to a lot of them. And so um, maybe a request to take the, add that to the action list and um, get it going, we'd, we'd certainly be happy to help facilitate it. So. Cool. Yeah, it, it, it resonates, man. Hello, I'm John, and I'm a recovering <laughs> entrepreneur. And, and I'm a Kiwi entrepreneur, so I'm always good. <laughs> um, I think the only thing I'd say additionally is, I mean, it's a, it's a great action point, but um, talking to people outside of your industry, um, you know, my first career, I had a boss who always used to end every kind of drama and crisis with the same question, you know, has anybody died? Um, and it kind of gets you thinking about, you know, well, yeah, no, it's probably not actually that bad. Unfortunately, someone did die, but um, <laughs> only once. Um, so, you know, I think there's, um, I, I've seen groups and, and stuff um, over the years, but the amazing thing is that everyone found them really valuable and they were kind of Chatham House rules and you got together in a, in a room, um, usually facilitated, this is probably why they, they stopped, usually facilitated, facilitated by somebody like a, an advisor or a you know a consultant who wanted to you know do a good thing but also have some return so I think it has to be started by by us and kind of you know organically curated somehow so that there's some continuity or at least a kind of point from the underground where people can can come in um, but it's really hard also because of the nature of of what entrepreneurs do to get them in one place um, for, for any period of time and any sort of quorum and I think those quorums are the, the really valuable things um, and I think this is a fantastic 
you know, seeing the, a lot of the faces I haven't seen for a long time here today, I'll get a bit of that. Um, so yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a great question and and one I'd love to help try and answer for for selfish reasons as well as other. I'd like to ask Matthew perhaps to tell us a little bit about how inflection has incorporated concepts of mindfulness uh, because some of the things that we've been doing there uh, haven't seen much around here. So I don't know, people might find it quite interesting. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think, so there's kind of two notions. One is how do we create more mindful workplaces that recognize the whole individual and create more of a, a holistic sense of balance? Because entrepreneurs aren't the only ones that face this. I mean, engineers are being asked to, to work insane hours and designers, and, and I think we all face it. And it's, it's kind of a, a, an outgrowth of the, the startup demands and the cultural demands that we're all feeling. Um, within our culture, we've just really tried to respond organically to what we feel is emergent. Um, qualities of recognizing, you know, people as humans first, the way Yosef started today, and thinking a lot about families, thinking a lot about time outside the office, um, how we structure vacation and, and kind of time off. Uh, we do uh, an all hands every Monday morning meeting, and someone kicks off the all hands. Uh, we've been doing it for, for many years now of, uh, with a, a minute of mindfulness where they just share something that's really important to them. And, and it's just completely volunteer-based popcorn across the culture, and it absolutely boggles our minds all of the time in terms of the different types of diversity of perspectives and things that people present into the space and field. And it's just really about you know, returning to this notion of community rather than uh, you know, employees and bosses and managers and all this type of stuff. But I, I just wanted to also respond to this notion around entrepreneurship um, support networks. I'm, I'm lucky to be part of a, a small group of uh, seven individuals where we've been meeting every six weeks for about two and a half years, and they're fellow entrepreneurs and investors. And um, there's a really safe space and container that's created in terms of being able to share some of the issues and challenges that we all face in an intimate way and really getting... Uh, to uh, to have this this up leveling, so I just want to really plus one the notion, Stefan, and um, we'd love to throw our weight behind uh, anything in terms of facilitation as well, uh, and how we can seed that. And we know some really great trainers and facilitators in Silicon Valley that maybe maybe we can bring out here and, and share their thoughts about how we can create these types of, of containers. I feel like we're just scratching the surface, uh, and we can continue this conversation more. Uh, we're just about to break for lunch, but I'd love to thank three of you for taking the time and sharing some of your thoughts with us. Thank you very much.